All right. So um, we're going to get started. So let's start with this case. Um, and the way that I'd like for this to go um, is if we could take turns uh, looking at the data and taking and going through an interpretation. Um, and this should be the kind of situation where you ask questions and I'll ask you questions and we'll go from there. Um, let's see. Can I get a volunteer to go first? Maybe Amanda, since you're unmuted successfully. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Sorry, my video doesn't work. Gotcha. So Amanda, uh, let's start with this uh, second case. Can, well, can you see the video that I'm showing? Yes. Okay. So um, we'll how start, you yeah, go ahead. Sorry, how do you want me to, to start? How would you start next week when you're in fellows clinic? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I would just go through the case of so she's a 74 year old coming in with dyspnea. Um, they give her height and weight here. Her BMI is pretty normal. Um, and we know that she's a never smoker. And then I guess I would look at her, her uh, flow volume curves next. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the flow volume loop? It, it looks scooped to me. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> the black dots there are representing what's intended to be normal. No. Oh, okay. So th that's the predicted normals. Um, so it looks like she definitely has reduced volumes and a significant, um, diff more so I'd say with expiration rather than her inspiration. And that yep. gives us that scooped pattern there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm gonna switch my share. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna switch to something where I can draw, which I thought was already installed. <laughs> there we go. Okay, um, there you go. So there's your case again. So the uh, normal is this loop here, right, that you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, hey, can you see my screen? Actually, you can't, hang on. Let me try that one more time. It doesn't show it. If you just draw the line where the black dots are, we can see it. Yep, that's way out and it's not showing. So let me try that one more time. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, so all I'm doing is connecting the lines. And so that's the expected um, flow volume loop. And what you'll remember is that this is expiratory flow on the Y axis. And so it's not volume per se. Um, this is the, um, the expiratory flow. And then below the X axis is inspiratory flow. And so those are the two limbs. And so you're absolutely right that this demonstrates this coving. And so she should be able to exhale up to nearly six liters per second, and she's down at two and a half. And so at all of the volume, which is along the Y axis, or sorry, along the X axis, she's got reduced flows. Um, and so the next place that I would go is to look at her spirometry. And what do you think of her spirometry? Or what do you look at when you look at spirometry? So I mean, total light capacity is fine uh, based on this. And then FPC and F. Uh, one as well as ratio is decreased. Mm -hmm. Right, and if we're talking about spirometry, we're solely talking about 
what's happening up here, right? And so the spirometry is just that maneuver where you have the patient uh, do tidal breathing. They then, um, actually it looks like this. So they do tidal breathing like so, take the deepest breath in they can up to their total lung capacity, exhale as much as they can. That allows you to see what the vital capacity is, that difference between the highest point on the curve and the lowest point on the curve. Um, and if you look at that volume that they exhale in the first second, that's their forced expiratory volume in the first second. Uh, and then that will allow us um, to categorize vital capacity, FEV1, and that ratio. And those are really the only things we care about uh, in spirometry. I think it's usually easiest to look first, uh, this is the wrong case, at the ratio. Uh, and so her ratio demonstrate that she's got obstruction, right? How do we quantify obstruction? There's sort of two methods. Or what are the two methods? How does the ATS guidelines suggest that we should quantify obstruction? So the, uh, the idea is a normal young adult should be able to get upwards of 80% of that vital capacity out in the first second. But as we age, this changes. And so if you're to graph out what happens to your FVC over time, if these are decades of life, it might look something like this. And if you look at FEV1, uh, because of changes in elasticity with the lung, our FEV1 falls further, uh, and so disproportionately. And what that means is that if we look at the ratio, the ratio uh, of a normal FEV over FVC ratio falls over time. And this is exaggerated, but it may look something like this, where When you're 20 years old, you should be in the 80s. Uh, and as you age, that will fall. And so by the time you're 80 years old, your FEV over FEC ratio uh, is likely to be in the 60s, maybe even the low 60s. And there's two different schools of thought about how we characterize this obstruction. The ATS's approach, uh, which is likely what many of your programs will do, is to look at the lower limit of normal. And so the lower limit of normal here is 63%. Um, and this is because of this woman's age. So her average predicted uh, FEV over FVC should be a ratio of 75%. Uh, but the lower limit of normal of that 95% uh, population range is 63%. And this is a more specific way of observing obstruction. And so by that criteria, she's clearly obstructed. The other criteria that's still in use is what the Gold Foundation and COPD experts use. And they look at a straight ratio and say, if it's less than 70%, that represents obstruction. But you can see that that has implications in the sense that if you use a hard cutoff of 70%, you're going to mischaracterize all these older patients who probably don't have lung disease and have a ratio that's less than 70%, um, which may be normal. And so these are gonna be essentially false positives here, where you're saying you have this disease, uh, which they may not have. The other challenge with that approach is what to do with this area here, which are primarily young patients who may in fact have real disease, um, but who, whose normal ratio should be well above 70%. And when they develop real disease and have real obstruction, uh, 
they may maintain that ratio greater than 70%. And so by using gold, these would be people who are essentially false negatives, where they have real disease, but we may miss them. One of the things that's important to identify is that depending on what your institutional practices are, and depending on the faculty member that you're working with, there will be variability in what their approach is to reading PFTs. Your goal during fellowship is to develop um, a structured approach to PFTs um, and then adopt a little bit of flexibility depending on the faculty member that you're working with. Uh, let's step back a little. How do we generate these normals? So if we look at this woman, we're saying that her FEV1 uh, is one liter, and we're saying that her predicted normal should be two liters. How do we derive those predicted numbers? Also based on demographics? Yeah, be more specific. Which elements? Or what determines what your normal lung function is or what could be normal for it? I mean, size of the body, definitely. So probably not just age, but the height. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we know that as we age, certainly um, our lung function is going to peak in early adulthood, generally in our early 20s. That's when lung development is, is finished. Um, and so we'll have our peak lung function in the early 20s. And so age determines it going up to that peak function. And then like I showed you, you lose lung function over time. Uh, so age is part of it. Um, lung size is part of it. But of course, it's very hard to know how to measure lung size with a tape measure. And so we use height as a surrogate for lung size. Um, and so that's why their height is important. Uh, and then the other thing that's important is their sex, uh, because men and women will have different sized lungs relative to their body height. The other part that we look at um, is either racial or ethnic background. And the reason for this is that there are differences in thoracic height relative to total height. Um, and so using height alone uh, as a surrogate for lung size uh, it doesn't work for all populations. And so the various normal populations that we look at um, categorize that or capture it. Um, and there's a few different reference populations that have been studied. The most popular to use um, used to be the NHANES database. So this is a, an American database that looked at a large population of men and women of different ages and heights uh, and measured their lung volumes directly, primarily spirometry. And then more recently, there's a thing called the Global Lung Initiative that is also looking at more diverse populations of healthy controls and measuring their lung volumes. And what we do with all of these studies is that you can set up uh, derivation uh, formulas that will take into account sex, age, height, racial or ethnic background, uh, and then com come up with a prediction for our individual patients. And you should keep in mind that that prediction is a mean and that there is a bell curve on either side of that. And so that's where these lower limit of normal data come from. And this is how we judge what's normal and what's not normal. So in this case, we talked about spirometry. Um, and we identified that she's got an obstructive pattern, uh, what we should really do is we should be ignoring this data because it has no relevance to us. Um, what we're interested in specifically is the ratio of FEV1 in liters divided by FVC, which gives us the 75% predicted, and hers is 47%. So we know she's obstructed. And then when you look at her vital capacity and her FEV1, you can see that both of those are reduced as well. So that's the first step, or that's the next step, I suppose. What do you make of her lung volumes? 
or which lung volumes do we care about? So I'd start with total lung capacity, and you'll see that her total lung capacity of 4.9 liters is 102% of predicted. So it's normal. What is TGV? Have you heard of this? It stands for thoracic gas volume, but really it's just a fancy way of saying functional residual capacity. And so it's this volume here, or sorry, not this volume, it is this volume, functional residual capacity, where at tidal volume, what volume of gas is in the chest? The way that you can find your functional residual capacity is to take a deep breath, to exhale passively, and when air stops moving, that's your functional residual capacity. It's the point physiologically where the lung wanting to recoil in and the chest wall wanting to recoil out are in balance. But thoracic gas volume is a snobby way of describing that when you measure functional residual capacity via plethysmography. Let's go back to these cases. So here we see that her functional residual capacity at 3.9 liters is increased. And so she's at 146% of predicted. And when we look at her residual volume, which is the gas that is remaining in her chest, this distance here, when she has exhaled as completely as she can, that's also reduced. Or sorry, increased, if you look here. It's 130% of predicted. So the way, there's variability here around how people will describe this. So at our institution, we would say the total lung capacity is normal, but she's got an increase in her RV and her functional residual capacity. Uh, and that we would characterize as hyperinflation. Um, other institutions will say, if you've got obstruction, but a normal total lung capacity, and an increased residual volume, they would call that air trapping. Um, and either of those are right, and we don't get specific guidance from the ATS about how to interpret that. But those are the volumes primarily of interest here. And the reason that she's got increased volumes there is that due to the severity of her obstructive lung disease, over time, she is retaining more and more gas in her chest uh, because of that obstructive pattern. And that's what leads to that hyperinflation. And then we're going to look at diffusing capacity. And you'll see here that our diffusing capacity, uh, which is 14 milliliters per minute of, um, per millimeter of mercury of carbon monoxide, is reduced. It's at 71% of predicted. And for our purposes, we'll say that this is a bell curve and that between 80 and 120 is normal. So the way that I would summarize this case is that, actually, there's one other thing we skipped. So we didn't talk about the comments. So the exercise technician or the respiratory technician showed us that the patient had good patient effort um, and that the results met ATS criteria for acceptability and repeatability, which means that she had a good start. Uh, when she blasted out on that flow volume loop, it went straight up, uh, that she was able to exhale for at least six seconds and reach a plateau, um, and that she didn't have substantial coughing. And so we know that these are good quality results that are reproducible and that we could count on. Um, she also has to have three maneuvers that are repeated um, that show similar results um, with a vital capacity within 150 milliliters of each other on each of those three episodes or attempts. So she's got good quality. Um, she has evidence of airflow limitation. 
she has hyperinflation, and she has reduced diffusing capacity. What would you think about for a differential diagnosis in a patient like this? It's COPD asthma, as an obvious. Mm -hmm. Yep, so she could have COPD. Um, she could have asthma. Um, what form of COPD do you generally have to have to reduce your diffusing capacity? Emphysema. Generally emphysema. Um, you'll remember how we measure diffusing capacity. And the way that we do that is to have a patient take a deep breath to total lung capacity, hold it for eight to 12 seconds. And they're breathing in a known concentration of carbon monoxide and of helium. And that goes into the chest and then equilibrates throughout their lung volumes. And the determinants of how much carbon monoxide are absorbed uh, tell us about the alveolar capillary membrane function. And so we're looking at the surface area of the alveolar capillary membrane as a whole. We're interested in how the thickness of that alveolar capillary membrane uh, is functioning. Ordinarily, these are microscopically thin endothelial cells uh, up against uh, alveolar epithelial cells with a capillary that runs between them. The hemoglobin concentration matters because this is what the carbon monoxide is binding to. And the cardiac output matters. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're trying to assess the amount of blood that's in the chest that's available for carbon monoxide to bind to. And so patients that have very sluggish cardiac output, whether because of severe heart failure or severe pulmonary hypertension, the number of passing red blood cells with hemoglobin will be reduced. And so you can think about that fraction of time that the red blood cells are passing through the alveolar capillaries uh, which is about three quarters of a second. Um, and if they're passing very slowly, there will be less carbon or less hemoglobin available to bind carbon monoxide. And then lastly, there is an impact um, from altitude uh, that the higher you go, there will be a slight um, and linear increase in your diffusing capacity. So in this case, in a patient that's got obstruction and has a reduced diffusing capacity, like you identified, we're worried about emphysema, which will result in a loss of surface area. Other lung diseases that might result in this pattern could be um, severe COPD with pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then perhaps if you had a combination of um, emphysema and pulmonary fibrosis, you would have a, uh, those two diseases work in opposite directions. And so you may have airflow limitation, but rather than having markedly hyperinflated lungs, that will be canceled out by the fibrosis, which will reduce your volumes. And it may result in something that's relatively normal or preserved lung volumes, but have a reduced diffusing capacity. Would in that case, if no index be more normal, like the ratio F3-1? Uh, it may be, but it may not. And those two things actually work. Um, they're opposed in patients that have emphysema and fibrosis. And so if you have pure um, pulmonary fibrosis, you tend to get increased airflows. Um, and we can talk about that in a later case where it will come up. Um, so they have increased airflows with pulmonary fibrosis. And then the countervailing obstruction might result in a more normal uh, ratio. It depends a little bit on how much emphysema relative to how much pulmonary fibrosis.
this one certainly suggests that it's more airways and more emphysema from that regard. Do you have other questions related to this case? All right, let's go to the next one. Let me have one of you guys work through this one. Roscoe, were you the one that we just heard from? Uh, correct. So let's try. So 67-year-old uh, man um, has BMI of 33, which will probably be important for the case. The uh, the spur the actual curve, um, the shape looks kind of fine and like goes up, and then maybe in the small um, lung volumes there's some decrease and there's decrease in the volume, uh, total volume. If I look at the spirometry, the index is fine, the the ratio to no index and the but the actual FVC and FV1 are lower, uh, so that points more towards restrictive disease. But then the um, total lung capacity is also lower, which would go with that. Um, and let's see what else. The, uh, you said TGV, which is decreased, uh, which would also go with it. There's kind of like a restrictive pattern rather than obstructive. So the if you were just looking at the spirometry, that's the, the correct interpretation, right? There's no evidence of airflow limitation. But when you look at that vital capacity and the FEV1, they're both reduced. And the ATS approach to reading spirometry says, look for obstruction first. You don't find it. Then look at the vital capacity. And his vital capacity is 2.89 liters, which is much less than the lower limit of normal for a man his age and his height which would be 3.96 liters. And so he's got no airflow limitation, but a reduced vital capacity. And then there's two potential explanations. Uh, the, one expl the most likely explanation is that there is a restrictive disease. And the way we would interpret the spirometry is to say, the spirometry with the metrically reduced airflows suggests a restrictive pattern, but you need to measure lung volumes to confirm that. And when you do that in this case, you see his total lung capacity uh, is less than 80%, uh, as is his functional residual capacity and residual volume. So all of his volumes are reduced. He has a restrictive disease. Um, and then you look at his diffusing capacity. And what do you make of that? Which of those numbers do you care about, Rostko? Um, I mean, actual number, I think, but I have no yeah, idea. Which, which of the values? Yeah, yeah. Like 12.65 that mm -hmm. we see. Yeah, we, and we care about both. The number that you're going to hear the most is that people will report what the percent predicted is, because that puts it into context. Um, if I heard that this 67-year-old man has a diffusing capacity of 12.65, I don't know if that's I know it's low because I know most people should be in the 20s, um, but I don't know what his body shape is. And so it's hard to interpret. And so the percent predicted is helpful for me as a clinician, hearing that number and putting it into context. If I want to look to see how this man has changed over time, it will be more useful to look at that 12.65 because we can then characterize how it's changed over time. Um, different labs will use different reference equations. And you can't necessarily compare the percent predicted from a study that was done at the University of Colorado and a different study that was done at National Jewish uh, because they may use different reference equations. Um, and so this will be the way that you'll know if something real has changed or not. Um, I told you that when we're measuring DLCO, we're seeing how much carbon monoxide is absorbed over the course of that eight to 12 breath second, or eight to 12 second breath hold. What does the helium do when you breathe that in during the DLCO maneuver? Why are we having them do that? 
so I'm guessing it doesn't cross the uh, to the blood, but it get measures the total lung capacity. That's right. And so it's a, an additional way of knowing how much lung volume is available for that carbon monoxide to cross. And so what happens is you breathe in a known low concentration of helium. Helium has uh, very different physical properties compared to carbon monoxide. So we choose carbon monoxide to see how well the alveolar capillary membrane is working because it diffuses across that membrane very easily. And then it avidly binds to the hemoglobin, which is passing. Here, the helium does not pass through those alveolar capillary membrane. And so you breathe in a known volume and concentration of helium. It mixes with this unknown volume of gas that's already in the chest. They're holding their breath for these 8 to 12 seconds at total lung capacity. And that concentration of helium equilibrates throughout that volume of gas that's in their chest. As it equilibrates, it comes to a lower concentration, uh, and then they exhale it, and we measure that lower concentration. And we can use algebra to solve for what volume of gas must be present in that patient's chest at total lung capacity. And it then allows us to anchor where our flow volume loop is, and then we can derive all of the rest of the volumes. The way that we use that from a practical perspective here is that that result of 4.52 liters is the alveolar volume. Um, and what you'll see and what you likely learned in medical school or talked about in residency is that you can correct the observed diffusing capacity relative to the alveolar volume. And that's what gives us this DL slash VA or diffusing capacity corrected for alveolar volume. In medical school, we made this distinction that restrictive diseases from the chest wall that result in low lung volumes, because of those low lung volumes, will give you a low DLCO. If you correct for those low lung volumes, then that number will normalize, and that will suggest that it's an extra pulmonary restrictive process. And you'll recall that it can be anything from morbid obesity through any anatomic layer until you reach the visceral pleura. Morbid obesity, um, problems with the bony skeleton, problems with pleural plaques, pleural effusions, uh, et cetera. You also learned that if you correct DLCO for alveolar volume and that number is low, that that suggests that there is a restrictive lung disease as the cause. Um, and the most common example is pulmonary fibrosis. So what you might encounter in resident or fellowship is that many people will only report the DLCO corrected for alveolar volume. And I'm gonna caution you right now um, that this is actually a little bit of a party trick. Um, when, so I'm an interstitial lung disease doctor, which is where this is coming from in part. The diffusing capacity in early interstitial lung disease is the, the DLCO is the first number that will fall. And the rationale for that is that when that patient has very early disease and you start to deposit some inflammation and some fibrosis in those alveolar uh, walls, you will interrupt diffusion before you're able to put enough inflammation and fibrosis to result in shrinking lungs. Um, as that scar accumulates and as it contracts over time, you'll operate or it will result in low lung volumes. Uh, but that won't happen until you have relatively advanced disease. And because that fibrosis is, is the cause of the low lung volumes, to correct for it is a bit of a party trick. It's a math trick that says this patient who has a low DLCO and has low lung volumes, if they didn't have low lung volumes, then their diffusing capacity would be normal. That doesn't accurately describe what's happening to that patient. Um, and so when we do clinical trials here, we look at uncorrected diffusing capacity uh, because if you correct for alveolar volume, you're adding an additional variable um, and is less helpful over time.
you have questions about that? Or does that make sense? All right, good. Let's move on to the next case. So Lamar, have we heard from you yet? I think he had a loud background. Let's see if he can join us though. Maybe. All right, Amanda, do you wanna try another one? I mean, if nobody else, I can try again. Let's do it, Roscoe. So 43-year-old man, dyspnea, um, six feet tall around, and the BMI 39, and extensive smoker. Based on the look of the, the curve, it looks like both volumes um, are decreased, and also like both looks restrictive and obstructive based on the just look at the curve. Mm -hmm. Then the spirometry, uh, so the ratio is decreased, 65% uh, uh, predicted, and both FVC and FV1 are also decreased, uh, which will look like obstructive pattern. But then when we look at the lung volumes, TLC is decreased actually, mm -hmm. um, and residual, uh, t so residual volume like TGV is also decreased. Um, which would go towards restrictive more than obstructive. Um, then we would go at the DLC, um, so the diffusing capacity has also decreased, uh, both percentage and the absolute number. Um, and then what you also mentioned is the ratio of that and alveolar volume, uh, which looks normal here. Um, so yeah, I would stand with, with the mix as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Now is the mix because he's a smoker, has obstruction, and then morbidly obese, and that gives it some restriction. Um, I'm not sure. Right, and you can't know that just from looking at this PFT. You can think about that based on the data that's presented, um, but you're absolutely right. So these, uh, we would interpret this as acceptable test results a mixed pattern of restriction and airflow limitation, or a mixed pattern of restriction and obstruction with decreased diffusing capacity that corrects uh, for alveolar volume. And then you're absolutely right that you just need an obstructive disease with a superimposed restrictive disease to get at that. Um, and there's a lot of combinations clinically that would do this. Um, and so severe, uh, asthma in a morbidly obese patient might do this. Um, forms of interstitial lung disease that cause um, airways involvement and parenchymal involvement would give you both the obstruction from the airways disease plus the reduced lung volumes um, because of the fibrosis. And you won't know that without knowing more about what that patient looks like. Let me show you something else. Um, so the, we said that the predicted looks like this. These studies that we've looked at um, have not necessarily been anchored left to right on volume, right? This is a flow volume curve. And so this is expiratory flow above the x-axis, this is inspiratory flow below it, and then this is volume uh, on the x-axis. And in a patient where you um, have measured lung volumes, you can then anchor where that flow volume loop resides on the x-axis. And so what, and by, uh, uh, just by practice, or we use, uh, zero as the point here and increasing volumes to the left. And so what lung volume would be located where I've drawn that arrow, Roscoe? Uh, sorry, I didn't really hear. Can you repeat the, the question? 
Yeah, so I'm wondering what is the lung volume at that point where I've drawn the arrow? As far as, um, yeah, total lung I mean, capacity, then, functional residual capacity, residual volume. So that's just before the inspiration. So it should be just the, uh, the residual volume, actually uh, the um, functional residual volume. Uh, so functional residual volume is if we have a spirogram that looks like this, right? This is functional residual capacity. This part here, that's the vital capacity, and it's the difference in volume between these two points. Where would you expect to have the highest expiratory flow? At total lung capacity, functional residual capacity, or residual volume? And you can picture this. So if you were to take a deep breath in to full lung capacity, how hard can you blow out? I mean, the flow should be the, the, the biggest in the beginning of the inspiration or yep. expiration. Yep, exactly. So this is total lung capacity. This is the beginning of the expiration here. Um, and so that gives you that peak expiratory flow. And then we have relatively effort independent decreases in flow that happen as our lungs empty. And when you're empty and can't get rid of any more, that's your residual volume. And then this is where the beginning of your inspiratory effort occurs. And then you do an effort dependent inspiratory flow. And for all of inspiration, that's all effort dependent. Uh, one of the things that happens here is, what if I had you take a, a breath in to half of TLC? And uh, let's, we'll put some graphics here. This is 10, this is eight, this is six. What volume of expiration would you expect, or what flow rather would you expect at half TLC? Would it go to 10 liters per second? Uh, probably not, but probably also not linearly half of it, but more like 70% of it or something. Yeah. So it's actually what, what we would expect to happen is that you would go to this point and then exhale. And if you were at three quarters, you would go to this point and then exhale. Um, and the reason for that has to do with the volume dependence of airflow resistance. And so what I've drawn here at the top, these are what happen to your airways at peak flow, so, or at peak volume. So it's your total lung capacity. Your airways are splinted open uh, as much as they can be by those surrounding alveoli providing some traction against them. And as you exhale, and as the volume in the lung goes down, there's less radial tension that's being applied to those airways. And so those airways then get smaller and smaller as you exhale. And this is the thing that causes those reduced flows because as you're exhaling, that total cross-sectional area of airways gets smaller. And so the flow that you can generate goes down. Um, and that's the thing that, that determines uh, what level of flow you can get. And that's what results in that decreased slope here. If you, um, let's see what the best question is here. Well, so what happens to somebody who, uh, like our first case, has airflow limitation and hyperinflation, uh, what would their flow volume loop look like in this picture? And if it's okay with you, Roscoe, I'm just gonna keep asking you questions because uh, you are engaging sure, so and I hopefully mean, this is helpful to you. <laughs> So total lung capacity would be bigger, as we said, mm -hmm. uh, because of the air trapping. Um, the residual volume would also be bigger, so it would be almost like the whole, like move to the, to the left. And yep. then the, uh, the flow would be, you said it's mixed restrictive, right? So it would be uh, lower 
Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, same pattern. And remember, the like, flow is independent of the restriction or not. Uh, but the flow is oh. reduced because of resistance in the airways. Uh, true. The, the volumes will be lower because of the, the restriction, right? Right. So if they were just hyperinflated, you would take that whole thing, shift it to the left. Their total lung capacity is now here. Their residual volume has moved up. And the amount of flow that you would expect here is reduced, and it's reduced at every lung volume along the way. And that's what results in that concave up coving of the flow volume loop. If, and not all centers are going to anchor their flow volume loop. And the examples that we've had so far haven't done that, right? They're showing zero here. Uh, they are, you can uh, realize what their vital capacity prediction is, which is that distance uh, along the x-axis but they're not centering it to show you what the residual volume is in a clear way. Um, what and about then the centered oh, one would be based on the predictive values, right? So we can basically just looking at the graph know if the TLC and residual volume is changed. Absolutely. And that's how we okay. report ours is that the blue is the predicted. And then you can look very carefully or very quickly just at that flow volume loop. You can know what's happening to volumes and you can tell if there's obstruction or not. And you can recognize that obstruction based on this decrease of flow relative to where you would predict it to be on that blue line. Similarly, uh, you can show what a restrictive pattern would look like in a patient that's got pulmonary fibrosis. And it might look like this. And remember this point here, that's the total lung capacity. The residual volume is also smaller. And the difference between those points, the vital capacity is also smaller. And it's smaller because in that patient, they look like this. And this distance here of vital capacity has to be reduced because the total lung capacity is low uh, and the residual volume is also down. And so the vital capacity is a bit of a surrogate for total lung capacity. Their absolute flows will be reduced because you're operating at low volumes, um, but the ratio will be increased. And technically at this point on a normal person, they should have stopped here on that blue line. But this patient has increased flows for that point and increased flows along the rest of each of those volumes. The rationale for that is that the patient who has pulmonary fibrosis, the increasing thickness and that traction that happens outside those small airways pull them open in a phenomenon that's called traction bronchiectasis and actually increases the cross section of the airways at every volume. And so you'll get increased flows through each of those volumes, but they're reduced relative to a normal patient um, who would be operating at higher lung volumes ordinarily. Get questions about that? Or if not, we'll move to the next case. All right, Roscoe, if you're up for it, I'm going to just keep having you do these. You're on film. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so 46-year-old woman with dyspnea, BMI 21, uh, smoker. Uh, so we have pre-bronc, post-bronc. Um, so spirometry, looking at that. So we don't have a curve spirometry. Uh, the ratio is decreased as are the FEV1 and FEC. Mm -hmm. um, now, is this bronchodilator or bronchoscopy, pre and post bro? Yeah, bronchodilator. So this is the way that okay. they'll show if you're doing a bronchodilator challenge. Um, so the so bronchodilator challenge showed some improvement of 15% in FVC, 28% FV1, and 10 in FVC, uh, 10 in ratio. Um, which should be significant, more than 15% as far as I remember, but I haven't reviewed it. 
prior yeah. to this course. Um, and then lung volumes uh, are, so total lung capacity is okay, um, functional residual volume is increased, so there is some air trapping. Um, and diffusion is decreased as well. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a mixed picture, uh, and it does respond to the uh, to the bronchodilator if my numbers are good. Yeah. So that so this is the opportunity to review what the ATS criteria are for a bronchodilator response, and the idea is that there is an increase in twelve percent and two hundred milliliters in either your FEV1 or your FVC. And so the rationale for including the 200 milliliters is that in patients like this who have very low lung volumes, there is some variability in just doing the test. And a 12% improvement in a patient that's got uh, an FEV1 of 600 milliliters is still only uh, about 70 milliliters, and so it's very small, and it's within the variability of the test. And so the, the reason for both 12% and 200 milliliters is so that you know that it's a real uh, and clear uh, improvement and not just related to variability. And so by both of those measures, this patient has that improvement, right? The way that this particular study shows it is the 16% improvement in vital capacity. And when you compare these numbers, you see that there is a, uh, a 300 plus milliliter improvement. And the same thing is true for FEV1. The, my next question for you is, could this be just asthma? And if not, why not? I mean, DLCO should not be that much changed unless it's some kind of like complication or longstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, what, um, what's the hallmark of asthma? Or how do we define asthma as sort of a syndrome? This is a bit of a guess what I'm thinking question. But what I'm wondering is, is this COPD or is this asthma? So asthma is, should be reversible. Right. And so this patient has an element of reversibility but when you look at the post bronchodilator value, you see that that ratio is still quite reduced, right? She's uh, still at 53% of predicted. And so this patient has persistent airflow limitation despite that improvement. And so the most likely explanation is that this is a patient who's got um, an overlap of asthma and COPD. Um, there are other scenarios that could do this. If somebody's got really poorly controlled chronic asthma, uh, they'll have um, persistent airflow limitation even after you give albuterol. But people who have run-of-the-mill asthma, they would have improvement. They might have normal lung function uh, or would have normal lung function uh, during those intercurrent periods where they're not having an exacerbation. Uh, but if they were having an exacerbation, had a mild decrease in obstruction, when you gave that bronchodilator, it should be fully reversible. And this patient, on the other hand, has ongoing rather severe restriction. So this case is primarily to highlight what we're looking for from a bronchodilator response. And how does DLCO fit in the picture? Yeah, so um, if we go back, let's, uh, I don't know where my drawing is. Well, uh, I'll put one here. So, I mean, is this just because of the uh, assumption that it's emphysema, emphysema uh, mm -hmm. due to the mixed picture and then what it has, or it can be just with asthma? Um, yeah. Because I so, assume that it should not be unless it's severe asthma? Correct. So one, um, one pathway here would be that if there were a loss in alveolar capillary membrane, actually I'll show it here, uh, that would be an explanation, right? So if you get a loss of surface area, that will reduce your diffusing capacity. What if you have severe distal airflow limitation? Um, how will that 
interrupt your ability for your lungs to absorb carbon monoxide. I mean, I guess ventilation would also be decreased and hence the gas, uh, like gas that we are inhaling coming to the capillary, to the alveoli and being able to, to transfer to the capillary. Yeah, so there's um, this concept known as a time constant. And so what it is, is it's the amount of time that it takes for your alveolus to empty. And somebody that's got severe airflow limitation, what will happen is during that eight to 12 second breath hold, they may not have time for that inhaled carbon monoxide to distribute or equilibrate throughout all of the gas that's in the chest. And in that case, uh, their measured alveolar volume will be reduced because it's not a true reflection of giving that helium time to interact with all of the gas that's in those distal alveoli. And so they'll have a low alveolar volume and their DLCO is low because that carbon monoxide is only getting into a limited number of alveoli. And so it's being absorbed over a lower number uh, or a decreased surface area. And so you don't necessarily know in this case uh, which of those is the explanation. And you would need imaging or a little more information from that patient to be able to figure that out. What about this one? This one's hard because they did not show you the predicted. I'll show you the predicted. Should look like so this. So 40 year old man, uh, smoker, BMI is relatively fine. The, uh, the pattern looks blunted, almost like, almost like pure restrictive based on the pattern. But again, I don't have everything. Oh, so you just put the, the lines. Mm -hmm. um, so based on the lines, it looks like, so you're suggesting that the, the flow is decreased, um, but then the total lung, uh, the, uh, the volumes are actually okay, right? Because the, uh, they're both four liters. Yep. Um, and so the, the important thing to recognize here is how the total flow is reduced throughout, right? And so we were expecting expiratory flow that was here and inspiratory flow that's down here, and we're seeing markedly reduced flow. And so that should make you worry uh, about an airway lesion uh, that's causing trouble. Um, and you'll remember that we can um, have different patterns when we truncate our, the, our flow volume loop. And so, let's see, if you see here, right, this is that same thing that we just showed before where red is normal. Um, somebody that's got poor effort might have decreased numbers here. But the other thing that can happen is if you've got um, a fixed airway obstruction. And so down here, this is what we're seeing. And this is easier to see in the cartoon where at every lung volume, that patient's flow is quite limited. And so that's a fixed airway obstruction. If you look at these other two, these are the other two patterns that you'll look for of either a variable intrathoracic or extrathoracic obstruction. And of these, the more common one that we see is this one here, which is the variable extrathoracic obstruction. And I always tell my fellows that I'll draw this picture um, on the margin of the test that I'm taking to help me remember what happens. But you can imagine that if you've got a variable extra thoracic obstruction, that during inspiration, these pressures in the airway are more negative and they would exacerbate that narrowing that's occurring here. And when you go to exhale, if it's flexible, you're gonna exhale and that obstruction will be relieved as it moves apart. And that's why you have that normal expiratory flow volume loop, but a truncated inspiratory flow volume loop. 
And the converse is the explanation for why in this example, a variable intrathoracic obstruction occurs. These are things that uh, you need to keep an eye out for when you're looking at flow volume loops. And we recognize them both by the shape uh, but also the predicted flows. And so this patient, they do follow up and you see all of these loops all have really markedly reduced flows. Um, if you've got two liters per second, um, that correlates probably to like a four millimeter diameter airway um, and is a, a sign of advanced obstruction. Um, and if you just looked at the spirometry here, you'd say, yeah, they've got a little bit of airflow limitation, but you wouldn't necessarily recognize what was going on here. In this particular patient, uh, it was somebody who was found to have tracheal stenosis um, and had, I think, a nine millimeter diameter airway. But this is one of the red flags to look for as you're evaluating those flow volume loops. Let's see. Um, all right, here's another good one. What about this case? So 57 year old, BMI is okay. Um, never smoker based on the, the curve. The uh, lung volumes are decreased, but the flow is okay. Uh, at least the pattern of the flow is okay. Mm -hmm. um, the lung volumes pre bronc um, so wait, spirometry pre bronc uh, We have normal ratio, and if we see is and if we one are okay, relatively. No, this is first is predicted. The next is actual. Sorry. Yeah. This is one of the other challenges of reading PFTs at different sites is that they put them all in different orders, uh, but you're exactly right. So if we, wanna, if we see our 59, 57%, but the ratio is five, fine 75%, which is like 98% predicted. Mm -hmm. um, and then post bronc, we see some changes in spirometry, but not significant uh, increase in, in, in either numbers. Um, Total lung capacity is fine pre bronch and no changes post bronch um, And then we have DLCO. Um, which based on the predictive and actually did it, they just did post bronch um, mm -hmm. Looks okay. Yeah, it's kind of the lowest low limit of normal. Um, and then it corrects for alveolar volume. What do you think the explanation might be for that low, or that pattern of restriction on the spirometry? I mean, it could be like just like poor, like the patient didn't listen to the technician and didn't do the full inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and then the pattern looks normal, but then the volumes are kind of lower. Mm -hmm. with the normal ratio. Yep. The, the other thing to notice, and this is a little more subtle, is that in this case, the total lung capacity is at the lower limit of normal, and the residual volume is a bit high. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to, let's see, there's my loop here. Right. So, so there is air trapping? Uh, a little bit. And what I'm going to show you here is if you have, uh, so blue is normal. So that's our normal spirometry. And if I, this patient's might look like this, All right? And so their total lung capacity is reduced. Their residual volume is increased relative. And remember the difference between those is the vital capacity. And so that patient's vital capacity is low because the total lung capacity has come down and the residual volume has come up. And this turns out to be the typical pattern for neuromuscular weakness 
the lung volume that is most effort independent is the functional residual capacity because it's what happens at rest when the, the lung wants to recoil in and the chest wall wants to go out. And so in neuromuscular weakness, that will be preserved initially. But those very effort dependent measurements of trying to measure total lung capacity and to exhale down to residual volume, which is also effort dependent, won't work. And so they won't be able to go quite as high for their total lung capacity, and they won't be able to empty as completely to residual volume because that's also effort independent. And then that difference is, is low. And so this is the typical pattern of neuromuscular weakness. What measures do we use with PFTs or in the PFT lab to assess weakness? I do not know. So there's a few different ways. So one is that we can do um, what's called a MIP or a MEP. Um, and so the, uh, let's see. So those are the maximum inspiratory and maximum expiratory pressures. And they have them breathe against a closed valve and generate as much positive pressure as they can. That's the maximum expiratory pressure. Or to generate as much inspiratory pressure as they can. And you can compare that uh, to normal subjects. And the problem is, is that that's a really crude way of measuring this uh, because some people who have quite substantial weakness can still uh, do a one-time effort that is within the normal range. Uh, so MIPS and MEPS are one approach. A second approach is to do a thing called a maximum voluntary ventilation maneuver where for 12 seconds, you ask that patient to breathe as quickly and as deeply as they can. And you graph it out and measure what minute ventilation they get over that time. And you can compare that to normals. And patients who have advanced weakness, that will be reduced. Um, and that is, it elicits that weakness a little easier because you're asking them to do it for a longer period of time. A third option is what we did in this case, which is this data shown below. So it's upright and supine spirometry. And this looks for a particular kind of weakness with diaphragm weakness. And what happens, I'll show you a picture, is that if you're in the upright position doing your spirometry, uh, that's a, uh, an advantageous position. If, on the other hand, you are supine and your diaphragm doesn't work, uh, then the weight of your abdominal contents pushes against it. And so when they try to uh, do an inspiratory maneuver uh, with a diaphragm that doesn't work, they won't be able to breathe into the same volume and that will mean that they've got less air in their lungs, and that will mean that their vital capacity will necessarily be less. And so in this case, they measured vital capacity prior, or in this upright position, and it was 3.1 liters. And then when they had them repeat it in the supine position, it fell by 53% to 1.45 liters. Um, and that indicates um, mod well, severe at that point. Usually we say 10 to 30 is mild, 30 to 50 is moderate, and greater than 50 is severe. So this patient likely has severe diaphragm weakness. And that's the, the explanation for these breathing tests. The thing that you should think about are, is, is to recognize that pattern of neuromuscular weakness with symmetric reduction in spirometry, a low TLC, and a high RV. Uh, would the diff no index that is kind of relatively high also indicate that or no? Uh, no, just that taking that the high? flow, uh, like the um, FEV1 to FEC, um, or let's say just FEV1 is l lower than it kind of should be, um, yeah. just uh, because of the weakness as well? Usually it doesn't have a, a much of an effect there. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the, the expiratory flow volume loop is relatively effort independent. And in this case where the guy has diaphragm weakness, um, he's able to generate that pressure in the upright position. 
if he had more severe disease um, where it was all of his respiratory muscles, he wouldn't have a nice crisp flow volume loop like this. It would probably look something like this, right? Where he had low flows at every rate and where he couldn't do adequate peak flows. You got other questions about this one? I think we got it. Maybe only one or two more. Uh, all right, let's see. So this is a different study. So this is a methacholine study um, or a bronchoprovocation study. And so we use this for patients who we suspect to have asthma, but where we can't prove it. So ordinarily asthma is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, we may do PFTs with a bronchodilator response. And if we do that and we've got a typical story and they have a bronchodilator response, we'll often stop. Um, but in somebody that doesn't have a typical story or who has well-controlled asthma when we test, we may not see any airflow limitation or obstruction. And what you could do then is this bronchoprovocation test. And the way that it's done is that they uh, do baseline spirometry. That's the pre-value here. Then they do a placebo where they uh, inhale nebulized saline. Then they inhale a very low concentration of methacholine, which is a histamine analog, um, and which at high concentrations uh, is bronchoprovocative and results in bronchoconstriction, but at low concentrations won't do anything. And what we look for is at what concentration of inhaled methacholine results in a fall in their FEV1 by more than 20%. And that number is called a PC20. And so when you look here, uh, you can see that the 1. FEV1, 25. yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Looks like at the dose at 1.25, it went 23%. Uh, right. So um, exactly. So the FEV1 was 4.1 liters, 4.0, 4.0, 3.4, and then 3. Point, a little less than 3.1. And so this is an early uh, fall in FEV1. And the ATS has criteria here too. And so the, S, the ATS criteria are if your PC20 uh, or the concentration of methacholine that results in a 20% fall in FEV1, if it's um, less than one, then that's severe, airways hyper responsiveness. If it's one to four, then it's um, mild to moderate. If it's four to 16, it's indeterminate. And if it's greater than 16, it's normal. And then you'll see that in this case, the computer calculates the specific PC20 uh, because by the time you got to 1.25, it had fallen by 23%. So then the computer comes back and finds out on this log scale, uh, what is the, the specific concentration associated with the PC20. And it's this 0 0.91. And then they give albuterol and show that it's reversible. And so post bronchodial or post albuterol, um, it's back up to 3.94 liters. The other thing that we look for here is to see what happens to the flow volume loops. Um, and what do you think of these flow volume loops? Think they're normal? I mean, the shape of it looks relatively normal, normal in the expiration and the expiration is kind of flattened. Yes, exactly. So uh, we didn't show the predicted there, but what you see is that each of these are relatively flat and under normal circumstances, a normal inspiratory flow should peak at sort of mid inspiration. And so this is expiratory truncation and it's consistent with a variable extrathoracic obstruction. And the one that we're looking for primarily here uh, is vocal cord dysfunction, uh, which can often go along or is associated with asthma. 
uh, mimics some of the asthma symptoms, uh, but requires different therapy. Um, increasing the intensity of your asthma therapy does not help with your vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, doing speech therapy work uh, to learn how to relax those muscles is the treatment. And so our interpretation here is that this is a positive methicoline test, which shows airways, hyperreactivity um, at this low concentration, and flow volume loops demonstrate um, truncation of the expiratory flow volume loop that suggests an extra thoracic obstruction or poor effort, because poor effort would also look like this. Um, and again, the the inspiratory flow volume loop is more effort dependent. And so poor effort would, um, would be reflected by truncation also. This is a bunch of different flow volume loops suggesting that it's more than just effort uh, in this patient. And then I think there's one last one and then we can finish. What do you think of this case? What's your impression, Roscoe? Oh, oh sorry, I, I was muted and talking. So, uh, eight, year, eight year old man, uh, smoker with the BMI of uh, 29. The curve uh, inspiration looks relatively okay. Volume looks relatively okay for is between four and five. And the expiration curve looks like the FV1 um, kind of didn't peak as, as much as I would expect. Like it's not the sharp. Um, incline um, and then looking at the spirometry the um, the ratio is okay the fv1 fvc the numbers looks okay lung volumes uh, total lung capacity um, is fine uh, but residual volume is low mm, okay diffusion decreased uh, the ratio, the, the alveolar ventilation is, I guess, also decreased here, uh, but the ratio is okay. Um, so I'm not sure, but like, let's see from the beginning. So spirometry, as I said, like the, the, the ratio is fine and the, the other numbers look fine, so it's unlikely to be a restrictive disease. Uh, sorry, obstructive disease. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, concerning restrictive disease, the total lung capacity is uh, fine, but residual volume is is low. Um, which might be the case in some kind of restriction, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And then um, the LCO is decreased, so there is some problem in the um, overall membrane. Yeah, and so this is a pattern that suggests um, relatively preserved lung volumes, although each of those lung volumes is right at the lower limit of normal and the residual volume is low, uh, but there is a reduced DLCO. And so one of the things that you should start to think about is what's my differential for an isolated reduction in diffusing capacity? What are some categories of diseases that you think about in that case. Normal lung volumes, normal spirometry, but isolated reduction in diffusing capacity. I mean, uh, interstitial lung disease can be one mm -hmm. if we're talking about the lung issues. Uh, regardless of the lung issues, the anemia would cause also this uh, diffusion without any changes in the lung volumes. Um. And the, the other category is pulmonary vascular disease. So patients that have pulmonary hypertension uh, would have this pattern because nothing is changing the 
the mechanics of the lung tissue. And so they have neither obstruction nor restriction, uh, but if they have uh, low cardiac output and pulmonary vascular dysfunction, then their diffusing capacity could be low. And so th that's the, the primary differential diagnosis for an isolated reduction in DLCO. It is pulmonary vascular disease, early interstitial lung disease, um, and that may be most likely in this case with all of those lung volumes that are right at the lower limit of normal, uh, or you're correct that severe anemia could also do this. I think an important point that I would make is that when we're interpreting these studies, we look at that total lung capacity, and since it's not less than 80%, we call it normal. But you should know and recognize that um, this is not a binary disease point, and that there may be very little that separates somebody who's at 81% of predicted and 79% of predicted. And so you do have to interpret physiologic data in context, uh, because this man might have severe pulmonary or moderately severe pulmonary fibrosis right now. He may have had lung volumes, if we would have measured them 20 years ago, that were 110% of predicted. But now he's got substantial fibrosis. It's resulted in a fall in his total lung capacity that is still right at the lower limit of normal. Uh, and his diffusing capacity has fallen outside that normal range. But recognize that all of these things happen on a spectrum and put them in context with the patient in front of you and the story that they're telling you. Right, especially because the in lung volume inspiratory capacity looks like that's the most decreased. Yeah, um, they're all decreased, right? The FRC, RV, TLC, they're all either low or right at the lower limit of normal. This is good. Um, where are you headed next month, Roscoe? Uh, USC, LA. Very good. Where are you now? Uh, just moved in, in LA, in the new oh, apartment. Uh, where'd you finish your uh, residency? Uh, Rutgers, New Jersey. Very good. Well, good luck. Thank you for being a sport and working through these cases. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks.